Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're talking about getting stuff done, executive function hacks to boost your child's productivity. I'm Ann Dolan, and um, for the last 25 years, I've been helping kids with executive functions um, and making school a little bit easier for them. You know, every day parents call our office looking for help for their kids. And just this one mom pops into my mind as, as I was putting this together and thinking about, you know, how executive functions are impacting families in a virtual world. And this mom was just like totally fed up with her son, Josh. And um, Josh, <laughs> Josh had a hard time getting his work done. And in this one particular day, this mom got an email from his history teacher. And the teacher said that he hadn't turned in this huge assignment that was worth about 25% of his grade. And not only that, he had three other assignments he hadn't turned in. And it was nearing the end of the quarter. And because Josh's mom is a concerned parent, like all of us, she approached him and said, Josh, you know, what's going on? Why haven't you turned in this assignment? And he says, mom, don't worry about it. I'm going to totally do it. You know, I've got it under control. Pretty much leave me alone. And she said, okay, if you're going to do it, let me see it. Let me see what you've done. He flips open his laptop and pulls up the home screen of his laptop and there are like 50 documents completely disorganized all over in various places places on his home screen and it was at that moment that that mom just um you know had kind of had enough and she was not just frustrated with her son josh but also with the whole situation surrounding virtual learning and here's what i know you know certainly her situation is not unique and that's because her son, Josh, is not unique in all of this. Many students that we see and probably living in your homes have had these kinds of struggles with executive functions. So let's talk about them. And um, also a little bit more about what we hear from parents. Here are some common situations parents share with us. I've got two other kids. He's not my only one. You know, many moms and dads will say virtual learning feels like a whole nother career and I already have a job. Um, Many parents report that their kids were actually kind of disorganized, didn't really manage time before COVID, but in their virtual learning environment, it's gotten a lot worse. And we see that too. Like if there's two areas that I can pinpoint kids are struggling with now more than ever, it's executive functions and math. Um, many parents will report that their kids don't really have a system for knowing what's coming due. They're always scrambling at the last minute. And part of that is because homework is often reported inconsistently and teachers have different ways of assigning work to kids. So here's what I know from doing this for 25 years. First as a classroom teacher in Fairfax County, I was a special ed teacher and a general education teacher, then as a tutor and now as the head of a team of 125 tutors. When kids struggle with these kinds of things, it's not willful. It's not that they just don't want to do the work or they're trying to make mom or dad mad. There is an underlying reason. And so often it can be found in these things we call executive functions. Now, executive functions are actually these cognitive capacities in the frontal lobe of the brain, right behind the forehead. And they're super important for success in school. And it makes sense because these are things like getting focused, um, inhibiting yourself from distractions, planning things out to get things done, understanding the consequences when you don't get things done. These are all executive functions. Now, the good news is that these things tend to get better as kids get older, but for some people, they're just never really well developed. And these might be the kids living in your house. They may just have inherent difficulties with these types of things. Now, here's the thing about executive functions. Um, sometimes they're just lack, kids are lacking in these areas and there are weaknesses and as parents, we can help. That's what we're here today to talk about. Sometimes the issues are a little bit more significant and the student is also diagnosed with ADHD. Now, not every student with weak executive function skills has ADHD but every student with ADHD does also have weak executive functioning capabilities. 
So here are the eight executive functions. You may hear of them in different ways from different people, but this is generally about um, where we're at with executive functions. Um, there's lots of them. And when we work with kids as executive function coaches, we often touch on the areas that the student needs help with. But for brevity today, I'm gonna to focus on the four areas that I see most impactful the kids in virtual learning. First is inhibition, the ability to bat away distractions, um, not spend time on YouTube when you should be in class, getting started, that's a fancy word for, um, or initiation is a fancy word for getting started, planning and organization, um, probably the most vital one right now. And then the last one, and actually this is the last executive function skill in the brain to develop is called self-monitoring. Basically it's self-awareness. If you're having difficulty, can you see that in yourself and correct the situation? We'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's get started with the first one. Um, as parents, you might see it as your child doesn't plan ahead. They don't always know what to do. They're always scrambling to get stuff done at the last minute. And it could be driving everybody in your house crazy and it's very stressful. So the underlying issue is that the student has weakness in that executive function of planning and organization. So what do you do about it as a parent? There's a few things you can do, but the first one is to have a weekly time with your kids. Um, it doesn't always have to be just your disorganized one. It could be with all your kids that you're looking ahead to the week. We front, when we work with kids, even though they may have a couple sessions a week, we'll front load one in the beginning of the week, usually like a Sunday or a Monday. And I think this is vital for kids. It allows them to see the week ahead. So in your house, you might take 20 minutes once a week, I call this the Sunday session, and piggyback it against something that you always do. Maybe you go to church on Sunday mornings, even if it's online, you could have this as a time after, say 11 to 11.20. Maybe you have a family dinner Sunday night. This could be 7 to 7.20. It's programmed in your phone as a reminder. And during this time, everybody takes out their laptops and they look ahead at the week to see what's coming due. Now, as parents, you may ask two questions. What do you have? And when will you do it? These are important questions for kids. They may put together a little list for themselves. Kids love post-it notes, probably more than list making, with the things that they need to get done this week in order, or that day, in order to be ready for the week. This is one that one of our students did. Now, you might not have kids that have long-term assignments because they're, say, in second grade. So for those kids, you may want to call it something different. Maybe you call it a clean sweep. And this idea, same thing, everybody in your household is in on it, not just your messy kid. The idea is that kids get ready and organized for the week ahead by tidying their study area. Maybe it's um, filing the electronic papers. It could be cleaning a place in their room, bringing down their dirty clothes. But the idea of a Sunday session or a clean sweep is that you're looking ahead and you're getting ready for the week. And if you do it weekly, you're getting in a routine, which is super helpful for developing a habit. We want to make it as visual as possible. So if kids are, you know, keeping track of what they have due, we want it to be on the open where they can have easy visual access to it. This is often better for kids than in a notebook. Um, I'm a huge proponent of whiteboards. I think they're probably the cheapest, best tool kids can have in their study space. And you can see this one, it's kind of a fancy one with a bulletin board. They really don't need that, but it's an example of a student who wrote down what she needed to get done. Post-it notes are perfectly fine. Really anything that's visual is really helpful to kids. Here's an example of um, a student we work with who, um, uses Google Calendar to organize what she's going to do. So we meet with her twice a week. Her tutor, Maya, helps her plan ahead to figure out what she's got to do and how she's going to backwards plan those assignments to get everything done for her week. So as we're thinking about going back to school, where kids are soon going to be transitioning to a hybrid environment where they're going to school two days a week, 
there are special considerations. So for example, um, when kids are getting an assignment, they want to start on the day it's assigned. So for example, if they get the assignment on say Wednesday and they have that teacher say on Thursday, even though it may be due on Friday, for example, it's important that they start at the day it's assigned so that if they have questions, they can ask their teacher in person. And many kids, because they're kind of apprehensive about standing out online, they don't want their camera on, it's vital that they have that self-awareness to say, you know what, I'm gonna get started on this. So if I have a glitch, I can ask my teacher the next day, I could go to the study hall, whatever it is. But it's really important for kids to make those inroads with their teachers and start on the day it's assigned. We also may wanna consider a launching pad. And a launching pad is a strategy I've used for probably 15 years with kids, but it's kind of gone out the window because of COVID, I'm bringing it back. A launching pad is basically a bin, a box, could be an old dish pan, doesn't really matter, but it's a place where kids put the things that they need to take to school the next day. Could be their backpack, it could be you know, their hockey stick, although they probably won't have those things right now. But the idea is the night before they get organized and they're putting all their things together. So there's not a lot of rushing around in the morning and they're launching into a new day in an organized fashion. So this could also be a routine that you say, okay, you're going to school on Thursday and Friday. On Wednesday and Thursday, say at seven o'clock, we're setting up the launching pad. It's your responsibility to get all your stuff together put it in a launching pad. And so you can launch into school the next day. Uh, and one mom says, um, Lucretia says, I started doing that to centralize the school stuff. And yes, it has worked when we work on it. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's hard. You have to keep working on it, don't you? But yeah, it, can, it doesn't even have to be a launching pad that you only use twice a week. It can be like, this is always where your school stuff goes. And it's so helpful for kids because our kids that are disorganized, they don't really think like that. Like everything has a place and there's a place for everything. They just think everything can be everywhere and it's not true. So as much as we can get them in that habit or that routine of having a place for things, it's super helpful. So um, let's talk a little bit about our next executive function issue. Uh, which we as parents and teachers uh, see it as procrastination, but the underlying issue, the executive function skill is initiation, getting started on something that you don't want to do. Because if your child has, you know, a really hard math assignment, or they could be on Instagram, you know, they're going to pick Instagram because it's easy. It feels good. And it's not a ton of effort. Math. It might feel hard, long, difficult, so they don't want to do it. The trick is, and we tell this kid, to kids all the time, you've got to trick your brain into figuring that this new thing you're going to start isn't so hard after all. Because if your brain thinks it's super hard, your brain is going to say, I'm not doing that. I'm doing this. So you got to make it super easy. This is a technique when we're working with kids um, and we're helping them manage their time. We're always asking, oh, tell me what's going to happen when you're stuck. And this is something we want them to pull out of their back pocket because we've practiced it with them. And you can do this too as a parent. Bring in a timer. I'm a huge fan of timers. I've used timers for kids from kindergarten to college, and they are like golden. Um, so this is actually one of my favorite timers. It's called the Time Timer. You can get it on Amazon. And I like it because there's little this floating disc. Um, so for kids that don't have great time management, that disc really helps them to visualize time. Now, you can use a timer to help kids get started three ways. The first way is you, this, you're going to have to show your child how to do it at first, but eventually you can leave it in their space and they can do it on their own. It's called five minutes of theory. So you set the timer for five minutes and you use this mantra. I'm gonna work as hard as I can, as best I can, with this as much as I can, just for five minutes. And then if I need to, I can take a break and then set it again. Chances are, 
after you're focusing furiously for five minutes, you can keep on going, but you just need that time and get you started. You could use tolerable time. The idea is anybody can tolerate anything for just 10 minutes, or you can take your child's age and add one to it, and that's their starting time. But generally not more than that for a starting time. However, there are periods when your kids, especially our older kids, our older elementary, middle and high school, they need something more than just getting started. Once they get started, they need a broader swath of time because they might have a big assignment they need to get done. Enter the Pomodoro technique. And I personally love this. It was actually developed by a researcher in the 80s. In fact, he was Italian and he did his research on this tomato kitchen timer. In Italian, um, Pomodoro means tomato. And he wanted to figure out when it came to paying attention, what's best for older students and adults? Is it, can they only sustain attention for 10 minutes? Is it an hour? Is it 90 minutes? Like what is the ideal amount of time you can focus without losing motivation um, and energy? And he found out actually it's 25 minutes. So we teach kids to set a timer, doesn't have to be this one, for 25 minutes. And you actually use the same mantra. I'm gonna work as best as I can, hard as I can, focus as much as I can for 25 minutes. And then when the timer goes off, you set it again for five minutes and that's your break. What the researcher found is that people can only sustain, your brain can only sustain four Pomodoros in a row without throwing in the towel. So for kids, it's often fewer, but let me show you how it would work with an adult or an older student. Pomodoro, break, Pomodoro, break, Pomodoro, break, Pomodoro. That's four Pomodoros, which is a lot. It might be your child could do one Pomodoro, or two Pomodoros, that's awesome. That's better than no Pomodoros. So again, this is a technique that helps kids, um, that helps provide external structure when they're kind of lacking internal structure to get started and keep on going. Sometimes though, kids issue isn't actually with getting started and getting going, but it's really with what do I do first when everything feel so overwhelming. Uh, we often see this with our kids that are overachievers. They're, they're often avoiders and they procrastinate just as much as everybody else, but they procrastinate because they're worried that it's not gonna be perfect and they see all their assignments as equally important when they're not. So we teach them how to do a must do, should do, could do list. And this is when you look at all your assignments and you say, all right, what's super important on this list? Like what's really important to my grade and it's due tomorrow. That's gonna to be a must do assignment. All right, next, what's a should do? What should I get done? But if I don't, it's not the end of the world because it's actually not due tomorrow. That's a should do. And then there's the nice to haves that honestly, they can come off your list. Like maybe you already studied an hour for your science quiz. Do you need to study another hour? Probably not, just scratch it off your list because it's a could do, it's a nice to have. So now you're really looking at your must do's and that's often where you know you can see, okay, I only have to do this. It doesn't feel so overwhelming after all. Let's shift to our third executive function skill. We, we see it for our students as not paying attention to online learning. The, the skill is actually inhibition because they cannot keep focus um, in the face of distractions. So what do we do? So first we want to allow kids to doodle. That means we want to allow kids to have a notebook and a pencil or a pen and making sure they have this in their study area when they're online. The reason is doodling has been shown to actually help people pay more attention. And in fact, um, studies have shown that doodlers can remember and retain information than non-doodlers, even if they're not doodling like the words related to the lecture and they're just drawing pictures, that act helps them to do something with their hands, releasing energy, and they're not doing other things 
like playing video games or whatever else they might be doing. So it could be a little journal. It could be a blank piece of paper. It doesn't matter. It could be a clipboard that kids have access to. Um, this is super easy to put in your child's study area. And you, you might say to them, hey, this might help you. It may not. But you know, in that time when you're kind of annoyed with everybody getting online and technical issues, um, it's perfectly okay to doodle. Or when your teacher is teaching you something it's hard to focus, it's okay to doodle. This is another form, kind of like a higher level of doodling called doodle notes that we found to be super helpful with our kids. Um, we actually started using doodle notes last March when everything went online and, and we found them to be just golden. And this is kind of what they, this is what they look like. At the bottom right, you see, um, you'll see blank black and white doodles. And this is how they come. And you can get them for free, by the way, if you go to doodlenotes.org or one of my favorite sites is Teachers Pay Teachers. And they're basically like graphic organizers. But when kids are listening to a lecture, and they're learning information, their brain kind of naturally compartmentalizes that information. So it just gives them sections to just jot down some notes. They can take pictures, um, or they can draw pictures to help them remember. They can take their colored pencils and go back and make them look super cool. But I like them because kids like them and kids are willing to go back and study from them because they're attractive. So doodle notes um, can also be a lot of fun for kids and, and they like they enjoy doing them. So sometimes though, um, you're working with a younger student and they may not be at the note taking stage yet, but they still have to pay attention. I've talked to so many parents that say, you know, they have little ones like first graders, second graders, the teacher requires their screen to be on, but it's just super hard for them to be engaged because they, you know, they have a lot of these difficulties. Um, sorry about that. I'm not sure what that was. Is so these these um, fidgets can become in all kinds of forms. It could be that it's a stress ball. It could be there are a few Legos that the child has at their lap. It could be these are. Um, texture pads that um, can be Velcroed underneath the student's desk so they can touch them um, and still pay attention at the same time. But lots of research shows that fidgets actually help kids to pay attention because they have a source for their energy and they can put it somewhere else and then allow themselves to pay attention and to focus. All right, here are a couple other tools, tools that can help kids, but these are the electronic ones. These are actually in um, the family of website blockers. So let me share them with you. The first is Stay Focus. It's a Chrome extension. The next one is Self Control, which is for Macs. And then the last one is called Focus, Focus Booster, which can be used for a number of different browsers. And they all kind of do the same thing. Um, this is where that self-awareness piece comes in for kids. You know, often kids will tell us, yeah, I'm on YouTube a lot, or older kids will say, I'm looking at threads on Reddit. Um, so they can generally say where they're wasting their time. And these applications allow them to blacklist the websites they deem to be distracting, and then to set a timer for a specific amount of time so that they're not going down that rabbit hole of um, on those sites. I like Focus Booster because it actually combines Pomodoro with um, the app and everything's for 25 minutes. So that's kind of cool too. Um, but I like these because even if as a student, you decide, you know what? I really wanna watch that YouTube video right now. Even if you disable the app or restart your computer, you can't get to that site. So again, kids have to be willing to say, you know what? This is a problem for me. They have to have that self-awareness um, and then they'll use it. So it's something you can have a discussion about. Um, you could say, I've heard about these and kids often know about these too. They haven't used them though. And you know, when we work with kids, again, kind of going back to that conversation of what will you do when you get stuck or what will you do when you find yourself distracted, having them tell you, um, I could use this strategy 
is really helpful because then they came up with the idea and we're not telling them what to do. Here's one for the phones. Um, I personally love this. I have it on my phone. It's called Forest. In Forest, um, basically when you click the, click the app, a tree starts to grow on your home screen for a specific amount of time. So let's say this is 35 minutes. It takes up the screen of your phone. So if at any time you go, you get out of Forest and you go to another app, you go to TikTok, you go to Instagram, you go to Snapchat, the app Forest will give you a warning and say, get back to focus, you have three seconds. And if you don't get out of TikTok, as an example, the tree will wither and die. Nobody wants a dead tree. They want their tree to grow to fruition, to be planted in their forest um, after the 35 minutes. And then the app will say, do you want to go again? So the research says that really phones, you know, shouldn't be right there next to you. They should be in another room. If you do have the phone next to you, it should be um, with the back facing up. But it's really hard to tell kids these things, especially if they've had free reign over their phones. So this is kind of like that happy medium. Again, it requires a little bit of self-awareness, but when kids see, oh, this can help me, they're often more willing to do it. Often we see kids that are feeling really stressed about everything with online school and who can blame them? You know, often they're feeling behind, like they're, you know, not participating, they're not getting it, their grades aren't good, they have, um, they have missing assignments and we'll help them boil it down to one thing. And you can do this as a parent. So you might say to your child, look, um, I get it. I can, I can tell this is frustrating and I can see why this is overwhelming. Is there one subject you might wanna focus on and have the discussion? Now, as I mentioned, we're seeing executive function in math. In math, because you can't really teach yourself math once you get behind, honestly. It's a cumulative subject where one still builds upon another. So when you get behind, you really need somebody else to explain it to you, like a tutor, maybe a different teacher, maybe a parent, somebody else. So let's just say, um, you know, it is math. And math is the one subject where you want to go to class and you really want to focus in on what you're doing. So that might be something that it's the only one you're going to think about. You know, this is a time when I'm going to put my phone in the other room. Um, I might use a website blocker and I'm going to be all in just for math, just for math. And then you might say, OK, within math, let's say there are four assignments that are overdue. What assignment, if you got this one done, you would feel so much better and it would move the needle. It could help your grade, too. And really just boil it down to doing that one assignment and getting that one assignment done. That can also help kids feel better. All right, so I'm looking at the time, it's 3.30, and I wanna switch gears to actually something I find um, probably more important at this time. Because honestly, I could share a lot of strategies. I mean, for 25 years, as I mentioned, I've been teaching kids how to better study, um, how to remember things, all of those, you know, how to be more organized, all of those are things that are really important to education. But what I've seen as parents and talking to a lot of parents, even my own kids, is that right now, even more than anything, is the relationship with our kids. And um, it's interesting. I was on a webinar this morning with a woman named Esther Perel. I'm not sure if anybody's ever heard of her, but she's done a lot of TED Talks on relationships. And um, it, it, she was phenomenal. I mean, I just loved her. I thought she was great. I could have listened to her for like three or four hours. And she said something and it reminded me of the same quote that I had heard about five years ago. And when I heard this quote for the first time, it, it was super impactful to me. And then when she said it again, I just immediately thought of our kids and virtual learning. And here's what she said. The quality of our relationships determines the quality of our lives. And I know that's a bold statement. I know it's big. And I know this is a webinar about executive function. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not getting ahead of myself, but just stay with me. I share this because like, we're all so stressed out at this, at this time. Um, for many of us that have kids with executive function issues or ADHD, 
it's super stressful because they're often, you know, we're fighting with them a lot. We feel like we have to be their frontal lobe. They're not always getting stuff done. We look at their grades, you know, and we go in panic mode. But I'm wondering if maybe it's the time to step back and think, okay, how can I make this better for my child? Not like every last strategy, but how can I have a better relationship with my child? And it might be just starting out being a better listener. Um, I hear from kids all the time how you know difficult it is. And even my youngest son, who's now a, a, so a freshman in college, he said, mom, you know how stressed out you think I am? And I said, yeah. And he said, okay. Um, multiply that by 50%. And that's how I really feel. So it's tough for kids. And so here are a few strategies that I think can help with that relationship. Number one, um, if you've seen one of my webinars before, you've seen that I start with this, a conversation. And anytime we want to make um, changes with our child, we can't go in with guns blazing and say, Hey, look, Johnny, I was on a webinar with this homework lady and she said to do these doodle notes. So that's what you're doing. It's just not going to go over well. But we might start with saying something like, hey, can we talk tonight after dinner? How is 730? So if you're upset with your child or they're not doing well, you're not approaching them in the moment, you know, kind of like the mom I talked about, Josh, she got the email from her, the teacher, um, the kid hadn't done this big assignment. She asks him to show it to her. He's got, he wasn't prepared and he had a gazillion files in every different place on, on his desktop. Perhaps if she said, could we talk about this after dinner tonight when cooler heads prevail, it could have gone maybe differently. So you're kind of like asking your child for an appointment like an adult. Obviously you're not gonna do this with a first grader, but it would work well with an older elementary, middle or high school student. It's more of a collaborative effort. So you might start with the words I've noticed. Instead of telling kids what to do, if you say I've noticed, you're merely observing a behavior. Let's say you've seen your child miss due dates like Josh, not staying on top of things. You might say I've noticed it's hard to stay on top of things. To me, that feels better if I'm a kid than why don't you ever do your homework or why do you have all these missing grades? Let's say they're having a specific, tr specific trouble, maybe with math. You might say something like, I've noticed equations are really hard. So basically you're noticing a behavior and you're stopping there. You're not passing judgment, but you're saying, tell me about that. And you're letting your child talk. They might say, I hate virtual learning. It's stupid. I'm not learning anything. It's our intuition to say, actually, I've noticed that you're learning a lot or it's not that bad, come on, everybody has difficult times. But at this point, it's better to say to our kids, hmm, I understand, I get it. And just to be a good listener and empathize with them and nod. We can also ask them powerful questions that kind of replace the old questions we may have been asking. So often at the end of the day, we might say, do you have homework? Um, for a younger student, like a second grader that might have the same two things every day that they have to get done, you might pose it differently and might say, would you start math or spelling first? For an older student, you might say, what's the one thing you wanna get accomplished today? And I like this question because it helps kids that might be holding a lot in their working memory um, maybe they didn't write stuff down. They've got a lot to process and they, they're juggling all these things. It might help them to boil it down. What is that one thing like I, that I really need to get done? You could ask, what are your priorities today? Now, and honestly, in a perfect world, your child would say, your daughter would say, let's see, mom, um, I've got that geometry test tomorrow. I really got to do that science lab. Oh, I can't forget to start that English essay. We both know that's not gonna happen, <laughs> but it could help your daughter to start thinking about what she might do first or second. So your kids may not be overly verbal in their responses, but if it fires up their executive function skills and gets them thinking, that's great. Here are some other ones. Instead of, did you study for your science test? You might say, what's the first thing you might do to get ready for the science test? Or 
you better start that history project, young man. What's something small you might do to get started on that history project? So these are examples of powerful questions we can ask. But in general, I haven't found great success with why questions with all the kids that I've worked with. So things like, why didn't you start that yet? Why did you get a C on your science test? Why did I get another email from your teacher? <laughs> They're really difficult for kids to answer. Um, they actually require a lot of critical thinking. So if you say, why did you get a C on that science test? You know, through your child's mind, they have to start thinking, okay, well, actually I got a study guide, which I did not do because I forgot about it. And I remembered about the test, um, I don't know, the night before, but then I just didn't feel like studying. Kids aren't gonna really share that with us. Why questions kind of result in conflict or like total disengagement, like don't even ask me, I'm not even gonna talk to you about this. So as much as possible, if we can substitute why questions um, with powerful questions, that seems to be better for kids. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, you know, at this point, we don't want to focus. I know this is going to feel counterintuitive from a teacher, but as a parent, if we're experiencing conflict with our kids over these executive function issues, we don't want to really nail our kids for the quality. Like, okay, if you have some misspelled words, you don't have enough adjectives in the sentence, um, I don't know, you miss some math problems, it doesn't really matter. You know, the main thing is that our kids are just getting their work done. So we want to focus on completion rather than quality. And if we see that the more we push on our kids, the more we push back. So if we're pushing this way and they're pushing that way, it's a sign to us as parents that, you know, we need to back off and take a different approach with our kids. Um, or maybe we need to get outside help. And <laughs> When I think about outside help, I actually think about um, my oldest son, his name's Will, he's, he's 22 right now, he's a senior in college. <laughs> but I remember these years ago, he was in fourth grade and Will has ADHD. And when he was younger, his, he, I will never forget in fourth grade, his teacher gave all these projects, but honestly, they were like parent projects. They were like dioramas and hard things that, you know, you have to get a parent involved. And, um, he inevitably wouldn't, he'd always forget about them, do them at the last minute. So we came up with this calendar and it was a paper calendar back at that time. And I would say, oh, what are some big things you can have coming up? And he would write down like diorama on that Friday. And then I would say, oh, what are the things that you need to do to get those done, to get the diorama done? He'd say, well, I got to go to Michael's and then I need to um, set up the box and he would write all these little steps out on his calendar. Like, great. So this went on for most of the year and he was getting pretty good at it. Um, and then the next year he says, I don't need your help. I can handle my own stuff. I can do it on my own. I'm like, okay, fine. So a quarter goes by and I get a message from his teacher that <laughs> kind of like Josh, he had it done. I, for I forget even now what it was, but it was some big assignment. And he had a couple other things that were also late. And I said, look, Will, you know, um, I can, you can do this on your own. I can work with you or I can have somebody from my company work with you. And he's like, I'll, I'll have somebody from your company. So Diana comes over, she's lovely. They work together at the end of the session. And I said, um, how did it go? I swear to God, Will says, mom, it was great. So what we did is we got this calendar. And I put all my due dates on it. And then we kind of like backwards plan. And <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this was the exact same thing we did together. But because it came from her, and I knew it was the same thing because I had trained her, um, he was much more willing to do it. And sometimes that's the case with kids. It might be if there's friction with you, maybe another adult in your house can help. It could be a tutor. It could be an executive function coach. It could be the college student down the street who's home because of COVID. But sometimes when we're feeling friction, um, getting outside help can, can honestly be really helpful. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we do want to preserve our relationship. And that's what our focus should be on our relationships with our kids at this point. All right. So I want to wrap up. Um, I'm going to go to question and answer in just a second. So if you have a question, 
please throw it in a QA. and a You could also put it in the chat, whatever easier for you. Um, I also want to mention that I actually created an ebook called Six Tips for Smoother At-Home Learning that has a lot more strategies, more practical strategies um, for virtual learning. And you can get that very easily by texting 8333-230-3843 and type in the word virtual. And at any time you want to reach me, if you have a personal question, I am always happy to help. Shoot me an email, give me a call, whatever works for you. My email is ann at ectutoring.com. All right, so I am um, going to, if you want to look at, write that number down, please do so right now because I'm gonna stop the screen share in just a second and I am gonna to go to the Q and A. All right, so let me start here. Um, hold on one second, here we go. All right, so Mimi just said, thank you, amazing. Well, I'm glad it was helpful. Um, and I am here to answer any questions. So if anybody has one, please put it in the chat and, and I will answer it right now. And if we don't have any, I will, oh, here's one. Um, okay, anonymous. I use the time timer and other timers. However, my son doesn't listen or pay attention to the timers or reminders, any suggestions for how to get him to stop and move on to the next task. Actually, that's an interesting um, observation you made because when kids have to stop something and go on to another task, it's actually an executive function skill called shifting. Um, sometimes we think our kids aren't focused enough, but honestly, sometimes they're hyper-focused and they're all about something and it's really hard for them to put that down and start something else. So um, if the timer doesn't work for you, I've also done other things with kids because you can help kids with time by either using a timer or using a task. So you might say to them um, when they get started, uh, if they're having difficulty get started, for example, and they don't like the timer, you can say, oh, what can you do just to get started on this assignment? So it might be that they just write, you know, they just open the Word document or the Google Doc, write their name. If it's an essay, write the topic sentence, and then that helps them to get started. Or you might say, um, what do you, what, what is what, <laughs> what do you need to get done? beyond getting started. If they don't want to use the timer, have that discussion. They might say, I want to get the first paragraph done. So this is blocking time by task. So if the timer doesn't work, I would say talk with your child about the task. Um, if they don't want to get started, it's super simple. Trick your brain into thinking it's not that hard. Write your name on the document or write the first sentence. And then if it's a longer swath, ask, you know, what is it that you want to get done? And that will help them just to get going. So thank you for that question. What are suggestions for playing for playing for 20? The idea to play for this time and then move back to the task or work. So I think I'm not sure what you mean by playing, if that means playing outdoors or playing a video game, because they're really different. Um, you know, when we think of screens, we think like all screens are equally the same, but they're not. Screens, um, there's high dopamine screens and there's low dopamine screens. So high dopamine screens are the ones that elicit a ton of that pleasure chemical dopamine in your brain. So these would be social media platforms, for example, TikTok or video games where you're getting a rush of this pleasure chemical. A low dopamine thing would be um, something else that you do online, but you don't get the flood of dopamine. It could be um, you know, like you're practicing your math class on, or on IXL, or you're involved in a class online. So those are more low dopamine things. Um, and then other things like you're outside riding your bike, depending on what you're doing, usually that's a low dopamine thing. I bring it up because if it's a high dopamine thing, it's incredibly hard to get your child off of it. So, um, you might have the time longer because instead of going 20 minutes break, 20 minutes break, it's just too broken up and it's gonna result in a lot of fights. Instead, you might have the agreement, okay, you have an hour for video game time. Now, depending on how you leave that video game time depends on 
how you get it the next time. So for example, if you're able to put your video game down when the time is up and you might even set the timer, you have, um, you have 10 minutes left, set the timer for 10 minutes or set the timer for five minutes. So they hear a warning at five minutes and then again at another five minutes. That's a little bit tricky. You don't have to do that, but sometimes parents will use timers to give kids a reminder of like, it's almost time to be done. Um, then if you say, look, if you're not off in an hour, even with the timer, then you only get a half hour the next day. You have to have some kind of agreement on this, but ending nicely is super important. Ending nicely helps me, makes me think that the student doesn't have a problem with like being too all in or addicted with video games. But when it's really, really hard to get them off, it could be that their brain is so entrenched in that dopamine um, that you may have to try something a little bit different. If you're interested in this topic, there's a guy named Clifford Sussman and he's out of Bethesda. Um, and this is all he does. He's absolutely brilliant. He does a ton of work with video games and dopamine and um, kids that are on screens too much. And um, his website is, I think it's Cliff, Clifford Sussman MD, he's a psychiatrist.com. But if you just type in Clifford Sussman, you'll be able to find him and he's awesome. So I hope that's helpful um, for the 2020. All right, my son is in 10th grade. He has executive function issues. We have worked with an outside counselor, but, I, but he believes he was humoring me rather than seriously thinking he could get something important out of it. He'll say, I've got this, but he routinely, routinely starts homework at the 11th hour. He has a planner, but relies on the phone calendar, which doesn't allow him to plan longer term assignments. Any suggestions on how to convince him to try some of your strategies? Okay, so a 10th grader, I think this is the hardest year in high school, actually, um, just from a parenting perspective. Um, it could be that he doesn't have a pain point. You know, there's two types of function, there's two types of procrastination. There's functional and dysfunctional. Functional, these are the kids that um, they do stuff at the last minute. They stress themselves out. They stress you out. They may not get the best grade on the assignment because they haven't honestly put that much effort into it, but they get away with it. And because this has worked for them for so long, it just kind of becomes a habit and they're functional procrastinators. It's harder for kids to change um, when they're functional procrastinators, in my experience, unless they have a reason. Sometimes around the junior year, kids wake up and say, oh, yeah, I have um, mostly Bs and a C, and um, that's not going to get me into the college I want to go to. And so they'll, they'll kind of mature and wake up a little bit and take it more seriously. But it's, it often takes some type of pain point, like a, a situation where they've um, procrastinated and they didn't get it done their work done and it's it's a negatively impacted them. It's often it often takes that failure to see, okay, I've got to do something differently. So it's hard to teach that to kids if they really um, dug their heels in. So if if he isn't taking advantage of what the counselor is suggesting and he's not into it, then I probably wouldn't waste the money. And I might say to him, like, look, you know, this is your journey. Um, if you're ready for these strategies later on, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to set you back up with the counselor. Um, you know, it basically, um, you, you'll need to work on these on your own. And I think it's okay. It's hard for us as parents because we want our kids to get the best grades possible. But if they, if we care more than they care all the time, it's a sign that maybe we just have to step away a little bit and see if they um, can figure it out on their own or see if they're able, see if they get themselves in situations where they have to course correct. So thank you for that question. Um, Patricia, uh, Patrice said, I joined late from a, Chris, from a conference call. Will this be made available? And the answer is yes, for sure. This will be available. Um, all right, so let me see. I think that was our last question. Yes, it is. But I hope this was helpful to everybody. It was a real pleasure to talk to you today. Um, if you need anything at all, please contact me, Anne, at EC Tutoring, and I am happy to help. I wish you the very best for back to school 
there's two days a week and um, for getting through the rest of this year. Thanks so much and have a great day. Bye-bye.